Hello, thanks for tuning into the show that goes around the continent to bring you stories near and far. I'm Chamberlain Nusso, a channel of television here in Lagos. I'm joined by Esther Githui Ewart from Voice of America in Washington. Thanks, I'm Esther Githui Ewart. Happy to be with you again for another edition of Africa 54. Due to the global outbreak of COVID-19, the Voice of America has reduced staffing at VO headquarters here in Washington. So as you see, our broadcast looks a little different for now. We appreciate your staying with us on Africa 54. Let's start off with the latest from Nigeria. Chamberlain Uso in Lagos brings you that story. The Presidential Task Force on COVID-19 has announced that the UK variant of interest, the B117, has been found in Nigeria. By implication, the task force notes that the country has become more vulnerable Hence, the urgent need for increased adherence to the COVID-19 safety protocols. Our correspondent, Gloria Omezuke, reports. It is official. The Presidential Task Force on COVID-19 shared the announcement that the new B117 variant prevalent in the United Kingdom has been detected in Nigeria. Chairman of the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19 and the Director General of the NCDC reiterate that the UK variant of interest found in Nigeria is more transmissible but has the same symptoms as the first. There have been reports of cases with B117 variant strain first reported in the UK found in Nigeria. Three of these were in travelers out of Nigeria and one a resident. This was reported to us through the international health regulations and it's most likely that these uh, strains were acquired in Nigeria. Uh, like I said, we sent 50 samples to them, I reported to you last two weeks ago. Uh, one of those samples came out to have that variant of interest, the UK variant of interest that is linked to increased transmission. The number of COVID-19 cases equally surge Gentlemen among the core members the as about 700 members in Batch B test positive, prompting a warning to states. Going forward, any state that refuses to cooperate fully, 100%, in the aspect of COVID-19 protocols adherence, full testing using the RDTs, and also data management by the approved staff of the NCDC, the health ministry, and also the trained doctors, that state will have its orientation camp shut down and the corpus will be sent to adjoining state. The PTF is expecting a $2 billion backing by the Africa Exim Bank loan to procure additional vaccines expected in March. Beyond the official reveal that the new variant exists within the country, what also resonates out here is a desperate appeal for states to ramp up testing and adherence to the safety protocols to mitigate fatalities within the country. Gloria Umezuke, Channels Television News. Let's get more on this story from a senior lecturer of molecular biology from the Nasarawa State University, Dr. Akiela Ishaku. Thanks for joining us today on the program. Now, last year, there were reports that Nigeria had a new variant of the coronavirus. Though not much was heard then, now the UK variant has been confirmed in Nigeria. Could you tell us what's the difference between the two? There are basically three differences between the UK variant and uh, uh, the first variant and the second variant that has been found in Nigeria. One of the differences is in their genetic makeup. So uh, a mutation takes place within uh, uh, the, gen the, the genetic makeup of the virus in terms of the spike protein. Secondly, uh, uh, one of the major differences between the first and the second variant too is on the population dynamics transmissibility. Uh, the first variant uh, affects only older population that are above seven, uh, 50 years of age. But the, the new variant, the, U, the, the UK new variant that is found in Nigeria, uh, affects 70% of younger population. And that's why we are having increase uh, or explosion in number of cases in Nigeria. And thirdly, uh, 
the first variant, the vaccines that were being produced by Pfizer, by Modera, and by Sanofi and Johnson & Johnson, targets only the first variant. It shows, and then uh, the second variant, which is the B117, uh, vaccine cannot be able to actually produce immunity against it. So it shows that, uh, uh, of course, Pfizer have started developing a second generation vaccine for us to actually uh, bring in the second variant into it. So basically there are three differences between the first variant and the second variant of UK being found in Nigeria. Schools have reopened in the country, but there are reports that the new COVID-19 strain is affecting children more frequently than the earlier strains. How then can the children be prevented from getting this virus? Absolutely. So uh, uh, I think we missed it. The presidential tax force missed it uh, by coming up with um, a more optimized and standardized protocol. I was expecting Chamberlain that uh, we would have had a national survey on our children, just like the way we had for NYC core members. We would have uh, deployed rapid diagnostic kits across schools and mandate schools to screen uh, children that uh, are, are going to resume schools so that we can be able to know uh, people that are infected. In fact, I have to withdraw my child from from school yesterday because two of his um, uh, uh, classmates were positive for COVID and they are within the age of five and six. So I think uh, we would have optimized protocol for school resumption for both primary, secondary, and even tertiary institution. Speaking about observing the protocols, we may have our job cut out for us because there are still doubting Thomases out there about the existence of the virus. How can Nigerians be persuaded to observe these protocols? Absolutely. So we need we need we need serious um, what is referred to as risk communication. We need to bring key stakeholders into this risk communication, into advocacy, into educating people. We have not seen much of our emirs and advocacy. We have not even seen the political elite and the political class buying in into this advocacy. We have not even seen celebrities buying in into this advocacy. So uh, we need to bring a lot of stakeholders into this. In fact, we need to also see how we can be able to bring survivors of this COVID-19 uh, on, on, on televisions, on, on radio stations, uh, 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 organization, uh, telecom, uh, you know, uh, televisions. So we need to do more of advocacy. We need to bring celebrities. Uh, we, need, we, need to, we need to bring celebrities, uh, bring celebrities together so that they can be able to take this message down. We need to also involve faith-based organization. We need to also involve community leaders, uh, community organizations, and a lot of people. Hans needs to be on deck for us to actually push uh, this message of COVID-19. Dr. Akiala Ishaku, thanks for joining us today on the program. Thank you. Welcome back to Africa 54. I'm Esther Gidu Yuat in Washington. Malawi is struggling to quarantine migrant workers returning from South Africa who are being tested for COVID-19. At a facility this week, returnees upset over living conditions clashed with police and authorities say about 20 returnees at the facility escaped. Lamek Masina reports. <laughs> After working in South Africa for five years, migrant Reba Gori Gaila was forced to return to Malawi after losing her job amid the COVID-19 pandemic. As foreigners, we were living in rented houses. We were supposed to buy food on our own, but we could not manage that. Gaila is one of about 600 Malawians who returned on Saturday and were quarantined at Mapanga Prison Training School. The facility was set up to prevent importation of COVID-19 cases, which account for 40% of Malawi's total caseload. But the returnees on Sunday touched the buildings in protest at poor conditions. Police used tear gas to end the riot. Some returnees say authorities did not inform them before they were quarantined. 
We slept on the floor. Mattresses were in short supply. The food was good here, but the hospitality we received here did not meet our expectations. Officials say all returnees were informed of the quarantine and allege that some may have been seeking to evade paying taxes. More than 150 of those being head tested for COVID-19 and are being isolated. These people will go home under escort, so they will not be missed out in the community. Malawi authorities are searching for 20 returnees not tested who escaped during the Sunday's revolt. I think it will be simple because immigration authorities have their passports, so it's easy to check on and see who is missing. Meanwhile, 39 other returnees were arrested and charged with planning the scaffold. Lamek Masina for VOA News, Blanta. The World Health Organization has reiterated calls for a more equal distribution of COVID-19 vaccines, saying least developed countries have to watch and wait while richer countries power ahead with their immunization programs. This comes as South African President Cyril Ramaphosa calls on wealthy countries to release their excess doses of coronavirus vaccines for countries that need them. We are all not safe if some countries are vaccinating their people and other countries are not vaccinating. We all must act together in combating a, coronavirus. a strong warning from the South African president, Cyril Ramaphosa, who is urging wealthy countries not to hoard supply doses of COVID-19 vaccine. South Africa has recorded nearly half the coronavirus deaths in Africa, and the continent as a whole is struggling to secure sufficient vaccines to start countrywide inoculation programs for its 1.3 billion people. The World Health Organization is also condemning what it calls vaccine nationalism, saying instead that vaccine equity is the way forward. It. As we speak, rich countries are rolling out vaccines, while the world's least developed countries watch and wait. With every day that passes, the divide grows larger between the world's haves and have-nots. Vaccine nationalism might serve short-term political goals, but it's in every nation's own interest to support vaccine equity. Meanwhile, the African Union said in January that it had secured 270 million shots for the continent to supplement 600 million doses coming from the COVAX scheme co-led by the WHO. Those doses are expected to become available this year, but none have arrived yet, while parts of Europe, Asia and the Americas are well into their vaccination programs. The COVAX facility is an initiative of the WHO and the Vaccine Alliance to equitably distribute COVID-19 vaccines across the world. Under the COVAX facility, only WHO-approved vaccines can be bought. So far, only Pfizer's has been listed for emergency use by the World Health Organization. The process to approve Moderna and AstraZeneca vaccines is ongoing. There is a, a almost a sense of, of vaccine panic that is going on right now um, with the new variants, with all of the bilateral deals, with the discussion about the urgency of getting vaccines out. Um, all of that has meant that it has become a different level of political conversation and people trying to move quickly. And that is leading um, uh, many to um, uh, reach out for other um, uh, vaccines um, as well. A few African countries have rolled out vaccines that are yet to be approved by the WHO. The Seychelles, Morocco and Egypt are administering the Chinese-made Sinopharm vaccine and Guinea, the Russian Sputnik V. It's time now for a short break. We'd like to remind you to visit our website, channelstv.com, for news and programming around the clock. You can also find us at youtube.com forward slash channels web. Still to come, Egypt's house with a hundred faces, a Cairo artist showcases his recreations of famous international personalities from Queen Elizabeth to King Ramses II. Welcome back to Africa 54. I'm Esther Gidu Ewart in Washington. Farmers like Katelo who grow crops in northern Kenya 
are once again battling swarms of locusts, which the Food and Agriculture Organization is warning are reappearing across East Africa. David Doyle has this report. A farmer trying to protect his farm. In northern Kenya, farmer Cartelo tries to chase locusts from his land, but his efforts are in vain. Swarms of the crop-destroying pests are reappearing across East Africa, the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization has warned. And in the town of Marsabit, they descended like a cloud. That's according to Ilyas Iman Abdul Qadir of aid organization Catholic Relief Services, who filmed the invasion on Cartelo's farm. He was trying to chase them, me and the driver also, we supported him, but it was too much as you saw in the video. But uh, he told me the most of his uh, knees and the beams have been affected. Swarms of locusts exploded from the end of 2019, exacerbated by unusual weather patterns that were amplified by climate change. Kenya, Ethiopia and Somalia were the hardest hit. On Monday, the FAO said immature swarms had been seen in seven of Kenya's counties compared to four the week before, and were also spreading in Ethiopia and Somalia. The FAO warned that any rainfall in the coming weeks will cause swarms to mature and lay eggs, giving rise to a new generation during February and March. Let's head to Egypt and enter the house with a hundred faces, owned by an Egyptian artist, Fadi Francis. From Britain's Queen Elizabeth, to the mummy of ancient Egyptian King Ramses II. He's made dolls of famous international personalities, which he houses in his Cairo home. Walking into this Egyptian artist's home comes with a greeting from Britain's Queen Elizabeth and the mummy of ancient Egyptian King Ramses II. The two international personalities, along with dozens of others, make up sculptures which Fadi Francis has on display in his downtown Cairo home, a hobby he has been perfecting for two years. I started with art when I was around three years old. Living in Luxor back then really impacted me because I loved monuments and art. This really affected my personality and in liking the art of drawing. Later on, in 2018, by mere chance, I started making forms from white ceramic paste and discovered I have a talent in sculpting. Francis uses thermal clay to carve and color in every mini detail of some who have become celebrity icons, including Nelson Mandela, Gandhi, Diego Maradona, Steve Jobs, and others. So far, the 29-year-old artist finished 82 sculptures. He is planning to finish his full collection of 100 sculptures of influential personalities in two months and hopes to exhibit them later. I was very keen when choosing the characters, so they were from countries all over the world. You will find personalities from Latin America, Europe, Asia and Africa. This diversity is very important for me because the project is about 100 international personalities. It is also important that they work in different fields. They are artists, football players, actors. I was keen to have this diversity. Some of these personalities also spread peace in the world. Francis was born in the southern city of Luxor and was raised by his artist mother and Egyptologist father, who both nurtured his love for art and photography. His passion for painting started when he was only three. He studied fine art on his own besides his work as a journalist when he moved to Cairo in 2008. Driving While Black, Race, Space and Mobility in America. A documentary by filmmaker Rick Burns and historian Gretchen Sorin traces the racial profiling African-Americans have encountered on the road since slavery. VOA's Penelope Pulu spoke with the film's creators. Driving While Black, a documentary by Rick Burns, chronicles the discrimination and violence African-Americans have often encountered while driving. In order to understand what's happening today, I felt strongly, we felt strongly, that you had to go all the way back to slavery because that's the point where 
freedom is denied and mobility is denied. The film documents how during the U.S. antebellum era, plantation owners employed slave patrols to monitor and punish slaves who tried to escape. It portrays these slave catchers as a precursor to white supremacists and some local sheriffs of the post-slavery Jim Crow era who targeted African-American motorists from the 1920s to the 1960s. Liberty is locomotion. It was a, a form of self-empowerment. You drive, automobile. You get to go where you want, when you want, not sit in the back of the bus, but also a, an opening to a whole world of challenge um, as you now must navigate this spaces where African mobility is seen as worrisome and unpleasant and to be stopped by a, a large cohort of white Americans. Perils grew for black motorists at night. So one of the hazards of driving was encountering people who were less interested in you being in that particular neck of the woods. And I say neck of the woods, a neck in the woods, you know, watch out for you know being lynched or being uh, harassed or terrified. How do you navigate the segregated highways of America if you're an African American, where if your daughter needs to go to the bathroom, if you need to put gasoline in your automobile, if, God forbid, you have a medical emergency, where are you going to sleep, where are you going to eat, where are you going to get your hair done? The Negro Motorist Green Book listed such places. It was published in 1936 by New York postal carrier Victor Hugo Green and put small African American businesses across the country on the map. Eventually, says Rick Burns, the expansion of America's highways offered a level of protection to African-American drivers, giving them alternatives to state and local roads. However, the film shows African-American drivers continue to be racially profiled and disproportionately likely to be stopped by the police. And so if people want to say, you know, what is this thing, structural racism? systemic racism, which has this kind of like uh, abstract quality at first glance. It's not abstract, it's profoundly concrete. Penelope Pulu, VOA News, Washington. And that's our show for today. You can find all the continent's top news and world news online at voaafrica.com. Check it out. I'm Esther Gdouyot in Washington. Channels Television has our last word from Lagos. We look forward to bringing you another show next week. Remember, ChannelCV.com is your source for news and other programming. I'm Chamberlain Usar. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.